Good morning, Trinity Anglican. You know, when I was in seminary, I was taught to read the Bible in a very specific way. I was taught to treat the Bible as any other historical book. In order to really understand it, what you needed was uh, an understanding and knowledge of the historical context of any of the books. So in order to understand Paul, you needed to know what was going on in the Greco-Roman world, and particularly the Jewish interaction with the Greco-Roman world. Not only that, but you had to have proficiency in the ancient languages and all of their grammar, both in Hebrew and in Greek. And I believe that there's some helpful realities involved in this, but there were also unintended consequences. And I genuinely believe they were unintended because I greatly admire my professors at the seminary, but there were consequences. What ends up happening when you view the Bible as a historic document that in order to understand it, you have to have a, a mastery of both the ancient historical context and especially a mastery of Hebrew and Greek and all the incredible grammatical nuances involved is you begin to believe that you have to have a mastery of the Bible, that you stand over the Bible, that you have authority over it, that you put the Bible under a microscope and pick it apart that you divide the Bible up into different books and into different words and even into different syllables within the words, that you exegete, which means interpret, into greater and greater, small, or smaller and smaller nuances, so you end up looking much more like a chemist or a biologist than a theologian. And then we get to Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. And we see an incredibly different picture of the Bible. We see a picture of the Bible that is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It brings us into the present of the one that we have to have an account to. You see, the scriptures themselves rightly order our relationship with them. We do not stand over the scriptures. The scriptures stand over us. We do not interpret the scriptures, the scriptures interpret us. We do not divide the scriptures, the scriptures divide us. The scriptures are not accountable to us and what we want them to say. We are accountable to the scriptures and what God has said through them. You see, the unintended consequence of believing that we uh, can divide and, and, and dissect the scriptures, while that can be important for the theological method, is actually, it very often places us over the scriptures. And we end up interpreting them in such a way that we tell them what they ought to say, rather than allowing the scriptures to stand over us and allowing God to speak what he has said to us. And so today I want to look at Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. And I want to look at how this asymmetrical relationship with scripture works, meaning scripture is above us, we are not above it. And how God chooses to engage with his scriptures through his living and active word. And how that's a far better image, a far better way of being a Christian than in the never-ending anxiety of dissecting it and restructuring it how we deem fit. So I just want to look at two things. First, what does it mean for scripture to be living and active? And then second, what does scripture do when we come to it? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. When I was an adult, I read uh, the Harry Potter books. I didn't read them as a kid. I thought they were childish when I was a kid, and I didn't want to read them. I think they came out when I was in middle school. But then when I became an adult, I realized they're incredibly good writing. And my favorite of all the Harry Potter books is the third book, The Prisoner of Azkaban. And it's definitely the best movie. Well, in The Prisoner of Azkaban, Hagrid, who's the, you know, the kind of bumbling uh, giant figure, he becomes the kind of uh, interim professor of... Uh, 
creatures of, of monsters and all those things. And he's kind of well known for loving monsters and keeping them as pets. Well, he assigns a book, and probably some of you know where I'm going with this. He assigns a book called The Monster Book of Monsters. And this book is a living and active book. When you get this book, there's a latch on it. The, the moment the latch comes off, it reveals that this book has fangs. And it will come and it will come devour in all your books. It will bite you. It will do all kinds of terrible things. you got to catch it and, and wind it back up. And that's, you know, a lot of the, the humor of uh, that book. But in order to get the book to open up, you have to treat it like a puppy. You have to stroke its spine, be kind to it, and it will gladly let you read it. Well, family, the Word of God is far more living, far more active than this fanciful notion of the monster book of monsters. You see, we often view this book as a passive object on our shelf. It's a passive object that we choose to engage when we pick it up and we read it. And while that is true, we do pick it up, we do read it. What we see in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, is that the primary agent of Scripture is God himself. The Word of God is living and active. This book is unlike any other book. This book has a life of its own because God the Son, God the Word, which is what John chapter 1 calls him, chooses to reveal himself to us through his divinely inspired words in the scripture. You see, the Bible is a place where God, the Son, has chosen to reveal God to us. God, the Word, has chosen to speak his words to us. And God, the Holy Spirit, has chosen to work in our hearts and to open our ears so that these words might penetrate into us so they are not merely dead words on a page, but an active encounter with the living God. When we say that the word of God is living and active, what are we saying? We are saying that God the Son, who is the word himself, has chosen to give a final and definitive word through his apostles and his prophets, which are collected in this book called the Bible. And that whenever one of his children opens it up and reads it, and the Holy Spirit in his grace chooses to open up our eyes, open up our ears, and soften our hearts, we have an encounter with the living God. This is not a passive book. This is not a, a book that we can master. This is not a book that we just grab from the shelf. This is a book that masters us. This is a book that speaks to us. This is a book that interprets us and reorients our lives because this is the place where God the Son, God the Word, has chosen to speak through His Word, the Bible. And this only happens when the Holy Spirit chooses to open up our eyes, to soften our hearts, to open up our ears, that we might hear the Word himself, Christ himself, speak to us. And family, this ought to absolutely change the way that we view Scripture reading. It's not merely an exercise in theology. It's not a place where we go to scratch our curiosity. It's a place where we go to encounter the living God. It's a place that we go to commune with Christ himself, the word himself, as he chooses to speak to us. The monster book of monsters could chase you around a room and bite you and do all these terrible things, right? But the word of God, what it does is it reveals who God is it reveals who he is because the word himself, the son, is the perfect image of the invisible God. And he chooses to speak that truth to us. But it also reveals who we are. That while we're, we were in darkness, while we were in death, Christ chose to die for us to bring us back into life. What the Bible does is it actively speaks to us the words of Jesus. And I just want to list a few maybe practical ways that this, uh, we can see the Bible differently in our quiet time. 
and maybe how that would actually help us encounter God more fully in it. First, uh, let me just say, all of these examples I'm going to give, they might not speak to all of you, but maybe be prepared to at least hear one. First, so often we see the Bible as just any other book. I'm reading Don Quixote right now. I can pick it up, I can drop it off, I can do anything I want with it. It's a dead book. It's not alive. Well, all books have some life, but it's different. Whereas this book, it's alive. This book is the place where the living God of the universe chooses to speak. And so what has been helpful for me in my life of discipleship is viewing the scriptures less like an object and more like a place. When we want to have a real conversation with someone, what do we do? We go to a place together and we sit down in a park. We sit down across a seat at a, at a coffee shop or a bar or wherever we might be. We sit down for dinner together and we commune. The scriptures are the place where God the Son, God the Word, has chosen to reveal his words to us. And therefore, when we go to our quiet times, which I pray all of you have, it might be more helpful to view the scriptures as a place than an object because they are the place where God chooses to speak. And so often we ask, well, what am I supposed to be thinking? What am I supposed to be asking? A conversation, you know, when we meet with someone, we have a conversation with them. Well, there's a lot of different things we can do when we read the Bible, but here's one of the easiest ways and, and most simple ways to do it. In any given scripture that you read, as you commune with God, ask him two questions. What does this scripture say about you? And what does the scripture say about me? This is what John Calvin called the, the twofold uh, knowledge that we are all seeking, knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves. How does the scripture reveal who God is? Who God is as the creator as he made all things, who God is as the redeemer as he chose to redeem his people. But not only that, what does the scripture say to me? What are you communicating to me today, God? Is it a word of repentance? Is it a word of comfort? Is it a word of assurance? Is it a word of identity? What are you saying to me in this scripture? And allow him to speak. Here's something else that's just incredibly practical, but I just want to communicate it. I've never read through the whole Bible in a year. Do you know why? Because I can't ingest that much information in one year. I can't do it. Some of you can, and it's a real gift to be able to see the whole narrative arc of the scriptures, and that can be a good thing. But here's the truth that we all know. Deep conversations are often only about a few things. Wide conversations often aren't very deep. When you go to the scriptures, sometimes it's very appropriate, and most of the time it's very appropriate, to converse with God on a small amount of text. To converse with God on a small number of scriptures as he speaks who he is and who we are in light of who he is. Don't feel bad if you don't read all of your Bible in a year. It's very appropriate and very common to simply read a bit of scripture and to spend substantive time conversing with God on what it's saying about him and what it's saying about you. And that's the last one. I want to say this quickly. Many of us are, well, most of us are Anglicans that are watching this. Many of us were raised in traditions where all you had was the Bible. And your tradition throughout tradition, your, your tradition throughout the Eucharist, your tradition throughout the liturgy and all those things. And so you found Anglicanism and it's a gift and now you celebrate the Eucharist and you have the liturgy and your priest wears weird clothes and all that stuff. And it's good. And often we can look back upon our upbringing in fundamentalist churches and say, well, that was just all about me, Jesus, and my Bible. Christianity is much more than that, and it is. However, it's not less than that. Family, you need the scriptures. You need the scriptures daily. You need to commune with the word of God, Jesus Christ, as he speaks through his divinely inspired word day in and day out. Yes, the Christian walk is more than just you, Jesus, in your Bible, but it is not less. Go to the place where God chooses to speak. Meditate upon his words. You don't have to read terribly much, but spend time talking with him because he will choose to speak. Now, 
When he chooses to speak, what happens? Let's turn back to our text. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eye of him to whom we must give an account. What we see here is when we come to the scriptures, we don't come in authority. The scriptures come to us in authority. The scriptures bring us into the very present of the presence of the one who has authority over all things, Christ himself. The scriptures pierce us to our very being, revealing who God actually, what God actually sees about us. We can't hide. We're like Adam and Eve who think we can hide because we put fig leaves over ourselves and yet we are revealed as being naked and ashamed because of our sin. This is why we start every worship service with the prayer of purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. When we come to the scriptures, it pierces us. It divides us. It makes us naked. It makes us naked before the king. And yet, family, do not forget that this same king that we stand before is naked is the very one who has chosen to clothe us. Galatians 3.27 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, which means have been clothed in Christ. When we come to the scriptures and we encounter the living God, yes, it undresses us. But family, we have to be undressed in order to have surgery. We have to be willing to be uh, reveal, we have to be willing to, to show everything in order for God to actually heal the parts of our lives that desperately need healing. When we come to the scriptures, we come into the presence of the one who already sees all of our sin and yet loved us so much that he chose to nail it to a cross to redeem us. Family, when we come to the scriptures, we come to the one that we can't hide from and yet we come to the one who's chosen to love us anyway. Isn't that the sign of a true friend? A, a true loved one? When someone knows everything about you and yet chooses to not turn away. When we come to the scriptures, we come into the presence of the one that we owe everything to and yet has chosen to forgive us of all of our debts and lavish us with all of his riches. Family, yes, the scripture divides but the scripture builds up. Go to the one that can heal you. Go to the one that can do surgery on you. And where does he choose to do that? Where does he choose to invite you to the operating table where his sword pierces you and yet removes the cancer from your life and rebuilds you as his glorified children? He does it through his word. Family, be saturated in his word. Be saturated in the one place where you know you can go and hear his voice. Family, be a person that loves the word, that goes to the word when you're afraid, when you're happy, when you're anxious, when you're in sorrow, that goes to the word again and again, day in and day out, to hear the voice of Jesus Christ, the voice of the one who chose to die for you, the voice of the one who chose to redeem you, the voice of the one who chose to bring you into life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have chosen to speak. You have not chosen to remain silent. We thank you that your word is living and active, that it's sharper than two, any two-edged sword, that it can pierce to our very being and yet heal us in the process. Lord, would we go to your word again and again? Would we be a church that's in submission to your word? Not out of obligation, but out of joy. Because it is the one place where we can go to hear your voice and hear your words of grace again and again. To the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray.